Perfect, perfect. Mm. So um, I'm just going to give a brief introduction um, about myself. Uh, my name is Dr. Denise Zambezi. And uh, today I'll be presenting um, some findings for my research. Uh, the research is titled A Social Legal Perspective on the Rights of Transgender Persons to Access Healthcare in South Africa. Um, I just want to turn off my camera quickly. All right, that's better. Um, so I will be presenting on my research, a social legal perspective on the rights of transgender persons to access healthcare in South Africa. Um, my background is that I've worked um, in the NGO space since 2000 and 2015, so quite a couple of years. I worked for the organization Access Chapter 2, um, worked on several programs, uh, LGBTI programs, including the transgender program. And um, through this program, I was inspired um, to, to pursue a PhD and to do a research um, looking into transgender health rights in South Africa. My background is law and human rights, and I completed the, the PhD with the University of Pretoria Center of Human Rights. Um, so at Access Chapter 2, I worked as a coordinator on the trans project, and I also did a lot of work that had to do with advocacy and activism, and work that had to do with just ensuring that trans trans persons have access to healthcare, uh, dealing with certain cases and complaints as well uh, from hospitals and so forth. Um, so yes, yeah, so let me just get into it since I only have 15 minutes um, into the research itself. So I decided to um, divide the research into two sections. Uh, according to the themes. So the sec first section of the of the presentation will be the trials and the tribu tribulations. And then I'm going to look at the triumph. And the trials and tribulations will be the background and rationale of the research, uh, the methodology that I used for the research, um, some of the key findings. The key findings will include um, um, the challenges that trans persons experience when accessing healthcare, but also looking at the human rights aspect, therefore laws that are uh, regulating transgender healthcare in South Africa. And triumph, I'm going to touch on resilience as well as this is a key theme uh, at this symposium. And then I will also share some of my recommendations as well. So I'm uh, just a background, um, trials and tribulations. So, Transgender persons remain some of the remain the most um, under, misunderstood population groups in South Africa, and there are many misconceptions about the transgender population. Uh, there is social and institutional discrimination, therefore making it difficult for many trans, including gender diverse persons, to access both general and transgender specific healthcare services in South Africa. And although South Africa has a progressive constitution, we know that South Africa has a Bill of Rights um, that protects the rights of every person uh, on various grounds, uh, including gender, sex, and sexual orientation. But um, despite these laws, and despite the fact that uh, South Africa still remains a leader in human rights in South Africa, trans persons in the country still struggle to access healthcare services. And this is linked to stigma and discrimination and also gatekeeping practices. But these are some of the points that I'll touch upon when I share the key findings of the research. So the aim of the study itself, um, I wanted to, uh, I think because I worked for the organization and some of the key problems that I noted working in that space was access to healthcare. Um, so I was inspired um, to pursue research. Um, at the time when I started my research, which was 2008, there was limited research on transgender healthcare, especially in the context of human rights. And it's still quite limited, uh, but there have been improvements between when I started in 2018 and when I completed my PhD this year in 2023. So there has been some progress, but I know that there is need for more research and there's need for more awareness and there is need for research um, that is like this. Um, there is need for research that actually involves trans participants and gets information from the from the perspectives of trans healthcare seekers. Um, so it was to contribute to the limited body of transgender health rights uh, research in South Africa, uh, but I suppose also in Africa as well, um, to create awareness uh, and possibly legal reform and just also um, contribute to evidence-based health programming in the country.
So the research itself, I used three approaches. Um, as mentioned, it's human rights, human rights approach. So I looked at rights, I looked at the constitution, I looked at international, uh, international law, and I, I looked at national laws as well, regulating the rights of transgender people to access healthcare services in South Africa. Um, the research took an intersectionality approach. Um, I wanted to get different perspectives uh, from different categories of uh, trans and gender diverse persons coming from different backgrounds and social demographics. So I tried as possible to implement the intersectionality approach and including like uh, transgender and queer theories as well, where the focus is based on the actual and lived um, experiences uh, of individuals. So as mentioned, the study started in 2018 and I completed uh, the study itself in 2022. Uh, the methodology involved, I used semi-structured interviews. I um, interviewed transgender persons from five provinces. Um, so the participants comprised of 43 trans uh, respondents aged between 23 and 45, residing in Hauteng, Pumalanga, Northwest and the Western Cape. Uh, the sample included trans men, trans women and gender non-conforming persons. Um, I also interviewed a multidisciplinary team of nine healthcare workers in South Africa. I aimed for healthcare workers who have worked with trans persons, who have experience working with trans persons. Uh, and then I also included interviews with um, uh, lawyers as well. And this feeds more into the legal part of the work, um, the human rights aspect of the work as well. Um, the interviews were conducted telephonically and um, face to face. Uh, for So for provinces, because I'm based in Hauteng, I'm based in Hauteng. So with Hauteng, majority of the respondents were interviewed uh, face to face. Uh, but for other provinces, um, the interviews were done telephonically. Um, ethics and standards as set by the University of Pretoria were followed because I was quite aware that I'm working with a vulnerable group and a lot of the topics were quite sensitive. And I think when uh, you as in the interviewer, uh, in this kind of work, you had to apply a certain level of uh, ethics, but also understanding and um, empathy as well. It was, um, yes, um, quite uh, sensitive topics. Um, the challenges included, uh, they included recruiting trans men. Majority of the sample was transgender women. And initially we aimed for a higher sample, but we ended up with about 43 trans men, women, and gender non-conforming persons. Um, so areas like Pumalanga and Northwest, it was uh, a bigger challenge to find participants in those provinces. Um, I used the networks from Access Chapter 2 and had assistance as well from TIA, Transgender Intersex Africa. But uh, with the more rural areas, the less metropolitan areas, it was quite hard to get uh, participants. But we did get a sufficient sample for us to be able to, I did get a sufficient sample for me to be able to put together uh, a paper and um, um, they're reasonable enough to to at least draw some kind of conclusion regarding the situation of trans persons within those provinces. Um, so there was also the problem that people were afraid of being exploited by the interviewer. And I think this is also where ethics came into place, but it also made the recruiting process um, quite complicated as well. Uh, I think because of the history of research and the trans population, uh, a lot of people are still afraid that they're going to be exploited. Um, so that's kind of what makes this work also a little bit challenging. You also need to create some form of trust, and that's not something easy to actually develop with interviewers uh, from marginalized groups. Um, and there was also a limited number of medical and legal practitioners. Medical was much better. Um, we got a good sample of medical, but the legal practitioners, it was um, much harder to find legal practitioners who have dealt in cases that involved trans persons or dealt um, legal experts working in advocacy uh, in terms of law and um, human rights. So um, some of the key findings of the study, uh, the study showed that transgender persons do experience uh, challenges when accessing healthcare, but this is something we know as, as it has been researched. And um, um, there's stigma and discrimination in South Africa, and this uh, normally comes from healthcare workers. Uh, at least within the healthcare setting comes from healthcare workers, uh, but also staff as well, hospital staff as well, um, that creates uh, poor health seeking behavior. 
And um, the services as well, they're exclusionary and they're not competent. Um, um, a lot of the healthcare service, as, as service providers are very um, uh, binary and heterosexual. Um, so they do not really create a sort of environment that is also welcoming to trans persons who are seeking healthcare services. Um, then there's the there's gatekeeping and the pathologization of uh, gender dysphoria that persists in healthcare as well. Um, there was a lot of conflict in terms of the idea of what gatekeeping is. Uh, it's one of the key things that I noted. Uh, when interviewing healthcare workers uh, and interviewing trans persons, trans persons, the trans participants had different interpretations of what gatekeeping means to them. And then the healthcare workers, uh, some agreed with each other, some did not agree with each other on what is gatekeeping, what's good medical practice as well. So that was quite an interesting finding. And I think it would be good to actually explore that. Um, I found that there is also limited access to healthcare due to high demand and restricted resources. Uh, um, so there is not a huge budget that is going to trans healthcare in South Africa, and this could be attributed maybe to also the lack of research. Um, there's not a lot of data about the number of trans people are in South Africa, and I don't think there has been enough political will as well to actually um, work on resources when it comes to, to gender affirming care uh, in the public sector. Um, there is limited access to hormone replacement therapy as well, and this is more. This was most evident for trans persons who are in Northwest and Pumalanga. Um, I found that um, many many of the participants were self medicating, or uh, were on birth control, or uh, were trying to access. Um, 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 hormones um, through friends and so forth. And this was this is such a huge problem uh, because obviously like uh, people are putting their lives at risk because they do not have services in their areas. Um, their areas do not have access to hormone replacement therapy, which could be provided within these areas, but the state has not made much effort to, to um, research trans healthcare needs and how to uh, allocate resources as well. Um, there's limited or lack of gender affirming surgery. Gender affirming surgery uh, is even a bigger problem uh, in comparison to uh, even access accessing hormones. I think one of the tragic things was just also talking to trans persons who are 45 and over who feel like they just will never ever experience that in their entire lives because the waiting list is so long and they do not have a lot of finances. So for a lot of the older participants, they almost kind of have given up on the prospect of being able to access gender affirming surgery in their lifetimes. Um, the much younger, younger uh, uh, participants were not really aware as well of gender affirming surgery or that it's provided publicly. And then you got more of the middle group, uh, persons who have been on the waiting list or who tried and uh, faced some kind of rejection and so forth. Uh, but it is a huge challenge for many trans persons in South Africa. And despite the fact that I think healthcare has increased the past few years uh, com in comparison to when I started the study as well, it is still a huge problem in South Africa. It is still a huge problem. Um, there's also limited trans-specific healthcare specialists, and I think the previous presenter also touched on this. Um, there are not specialists, many specialists here in Hauteng as well. Uh, so we did. I did recommend that perhaps uh, there is need for more um, uh, medical students to be um, um, to be attracted, to be in, <laughs> there is need for medical students, more medical students to basically study trend, um, transgender specific healthcare. Um, so there's also limited access to, limited access and incompetent social psychosocial support services as well. Um, so for a lot of the participants, uh, psychosocial service was quite complicated because some uh, respond participants thought that, um, um, the psychologist or the therapist or the social worker did not really understand trans people. A majority preferred to go to a psychologist that's also trans, but there was also a sense of community as well, where some individuals uh, relied on friends. Um, and there were other individuals who fought the battles alone and said they just preferred to fight the battles and deal with their own mental issues. Um, deal with their own um, depression and anxiety um, uh, by themselves as opposed to actually going to see a therapist. Uh, yeah, so psychosocial, psychosocial support is also weak in South Africa. Um, 
So gender affirming care is centralized, mostly uh, within metropolitan areas, rural areas, uh, individuals do not really have access. Um, there's also limited health H HIV programming as well, while it has also progressed over time. I think the problem with HIV programming, it still uh, does not, it's not inclusive enough of transgender people, uh, low income and unemployment. So the findings, so the study found that trans persons who are from low income and unemployment struggled more to access healthcare services and also like um, lacked uh, knowledge as well. There was less access to knowledge. Um, and then there's also lack of gender legal recognition. Um, some participants um, claimed that they struggled to get access to legal gender recognition, but the experiences were different. But I thought this was an important aspect of the work because it does lead to healthcare and there were different perspectives about how gender recognition and healthcare um, 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 are linked to each other. And then there was also lack of transgender health research and access to information. So there's just not enough research. So there is a need for the state to actually start collecting data on the transgender population so that healthcare services can improve. And like mentioned earlier, resources can also be distributed in a way that is evidence-based. Um, and then uh, when it comes to the legal part, as this is a social legal um, research, well, I found that, and I found that uh, if you're doing access to healthcare, you cannot look at access to healthcare in isolation. Um, the the violation of access to healthcare also violates uh, equality rights, the right to dignity, right to self determination, access to information, uh, the right to recognition and freedom of expression, uh, bodily and psychological integrity as well. So, healthcare itself it branches into the violation of many many other rights. Uh, these are explained more in the thesis, but um, since I'm trying to present within 15 minutes, uh, I'll just skip to the next slide. Um, so some of the key legal problems that are in South Africa, and these are just some of them, is that there is a lack of explicit mention of trans, um, of um, uh, gender identity uh, within South Africa's national laws, including the constitution. The constitution doesn't recognize gender identity. Of course, cases have been interpreted um, um, to have interpreted the law to mean that trans persons are protected, trans persons are protected from stigma and discrimination and so forth, but there hasn't been a lot of like um, explicit recognition of trans persons in, uh, in South African national laws. Um, secondly, there's also the issue of Act 49 as well. Um, I think Ricky also touched on it. Act 49 is outdated and it's not the most progressive act as well. So there is a need to actually uh, go back and revise um, or even scratch it out and come up with new gender recognition laws as well. But this is uh, something that South Africa needs to work on because this is a very important document. And uh, yeah, it also links to access to health care ultimately as well. Um, and then there's also the lack of hate crime, uh, hate crime legislation in South Africa. And um, Yes, so some things might not be, uh, certain laws might not be directly to help, like anti, like hate crime, for example, um, the hate crime law, but uh, trans persons are vulnerable to assault and uh, violence as well and, and do require access to healthcare services. So there's a need and protection from stigma and dis discrimination and violence in society. So there's just a need uh, for the hate crimes um, legislation to come uh, to regulate um, um, these human rights violations. There's also a lack of endorsed healthcare guidelines and policies on the transgender population by the South African government. Um, there's a lack of understanding of laws. There's a lack of political will and adherence to the provisions set in the South African constitution. And there's also um, underreporting as well, because there's no, uh, in my research, uh, there were no cases that specifically dealt with healthcare services, although there were quite a number of cases that looked into discrimination. I mean, I used um, information from the Jade September case as well, which was uh, quite brown, groundbreaking, um, but there were not many cases involving um, human rights violations experienced by transgender persons. Um, and this could be for a couple of reasons. 
while there's um, underreporting, I think it's just uh, people are also to report cases because of sec secondary discrimination. Um, lack of information about the court system as well plays a role on why a lot of cases are underreported. Because just working within the NGO space, we did find that there are a lot of issues and there are a lot of problems that are happening within um, the healthcare sector. But the cases are still quite low. Um, and they're not where they should be. And uh, the more cases that come to to court, then um, the higher the chances of legal reform as well. And then also just uh, based on interviews with legal practitioners, I found that not a little, a lot of um, within the legal within the legal space, um, there's not a lot, a lot of uh, awareness as well. Um, there was one case that I worked on at Access Chapter Two, where we it took a long time for the case to go through because the judge was nervous about uh, presiding over a case involving a trans woman because he was worried that he was going to say the wrong thing and he's going to be um, 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 he's going to be exposed for not being knowledgeable about the topic and so forth so um, that's one of the practical um, experiences and I in, and the interview also involved participants who are also in that in that case as well uh, but it was a delay because the judge was uncertain about many things when it came to the case. So there's need to also sensitize lawyers as well when it comes to uh, trans persons. Um, so I'm going to look at the triumphs. Denise, you so, are out of time. So oh, okay. Start I mean, up, please. All right, no problem. Okay, so the triumphs would be, um, um, what I noted is that people, um, participants were able to navigate stigma and discrimination in society. So uh, there's still a sense of pride um, um, and um, there's also persistence as well. Individuals not giving up despite being rejected in different healthcare environments. Individuals continued to seek healthcare and so forth. Um, and then there's a sense of community as well, a uh, sense of community that was empowering, uh, especially individuals who required information and who were uh, dis um, who were um, discriminated by family members or kicked out of family homes. And then there's also activism as well. Um, activism has progressed in South Africa. So the recommendations would be just to empower trans uh, persons and create more agency. Um, there's need for collaboration. Um, there's need to increase research, uh, legal reform of national laws, education, um, sensitization training, upscale resource allocation, improve access to information, upscaling advocacy and um, civil society participation, and just drawing inspiration from other countries such as Malta and Argentina and trying to see how uh, laws can be developed in the South African context and how they have worked in other countries. Um, so yes, that's it. <laughs>